Welcome to Maxwell Institute Conversations, special videocast episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast, hosted by Terrell Givens and created in collaboration with Faith Matters Foundation. You can watch this episode in your podcast app, or if you're on the run, listen to the audio version. Thomas Worthland McConkie was born into a prominent American Latter-day Saint family, but the faith didn't resonate with him as a teenager. He disconnected from the church and began exploring the wider world's faith traditions. He followed a thread through Eastern religion and philosophy, and was surprised when that thread guided him all the way back to the faith of his youth. As a specialist in meditation and adult psychological development, Thomas Worthland McConkie appreciates how connecting with his past opens a new vision of the future. Like even the way we use revelation, the word revelation, in Mormonism, it's got a simultaneous kind of reaching back into the past, what was lost, and yet it's also got this simultaneous reaching into the future and putting more flesh, bone, and substance to what hasn't been fully realized. So my my experience with meditation is that there's, there's nothing that I can discover that's in meditation that isn't Uh, resonating with the tradition already. Thomas Wordland McConkie, author of Navigating Mormon Faith Crisis, joins Terrell Givens to talk about his journey in this episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations, part of the Maxwell Institute podcast and sponsored by the Faith Matters Foundation. Hello and welcome to another installment of Conversations with Terrell Givens, sponsored by the Faith Matters Foundation. I'm your host, and this is a a videocast series devoted to exploring the experience of lived Mormonism as a catalyst to the abundant life and the public good. And today with us is Thomas McConkie, uh, author, speaker, mindfulness guru, um, and a a fascinating conversationalist. So we're happy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Terrell. Great to be here with you. We always like to start by getting a little bit of background on our guests. And so I'm going to ask you to fill us in just a little bit for those who aren't familiar with you or your work. Yeah. Uh, So let's imagine uh, that we're reading your obituary 50 years from now or 75 years from now. What's it likely to tell us? And kind of an official uh, obituary, not, not written by you. Oh, it always depends on who writes your history, right? It does. That's right. Um, You know, when you ask me about an obituary, uh, I apologize if this comes off as kind of a foreign or Eastern notion, but that tends to be what I'm known for a little bit in the Mormon circles. Um, You know, I I have this hope that uh, who I am as an individual isn't remembered so much as the uh, the spirit that comes through all of us. I uh, actually hope and live in a way that I, I aspire to not be remembered, if I may be so bold. <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting idea. I mean, there, I think there's some Western um, precedents for that idea as well. I've heard it Help said- Help me connect them. I, okay. Well, I've heard it said that the best teaching uh, leaves the students with a memory of what was taught yeah. and not the personality behind the lectern. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'll go for that, absolutely. Um, That's what's coming up at the moment, kind of a simplicity that uh, I'm I'm less concerned about specific so-called accomplishments or um, experiences in my life, even personality traits so much as just, I, I I hope to give myself to and point people back to a basic goodness that deeply informs my life and has been really animated by my participation in the church. Oh, good. Well, I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, tell us a little bit in the meantime about what, I mean, how do you fill your nine to five? What, what, what is your line of work? Oh, it's pretty <coughs> colorful these days. Um, I'm, I'm finishing up a second book right now that I'm really excited about. Um, so writing takes up a lot of my time. I've been really involved in a research project uh, based in Seattle up at Pacific Integral. It's an institute that researches adult development. So I've been doing primary research, doing the working with the instrument where we assess adults, and I've been facilitating a program that's year-round where we work with adults and take them in deeply to an experience and notice how they shift, how they change, how they grow during the one-year experience. Uh, So I've been really deeply involved in developmental research. And I've also, just this year, it was last September, 
of 2016, I and a few other people uh, that I'm close with started a community called Lower Lights, which uh, that, that takes up more and more time, and we could maybe talk about that as well. Yeah, let's, we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah. Now, you, you talk about your work in the, the theory of development, mm -hmm. uh, developmental, developmental stages, mm -hmm. and you use that as a kind of lens or prism through which you look at the experience of Mormonism. Mm. Uh, before we turn to that subject, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Let me phrase the question this way. Uh, I typically like to quote William Wordsworth, the great poet, as referring to uh, the fact that he says there are in our existence spots of time mm. That, mm. that shape, that mold us. He says that we remember with a renovating virtue from time to time. So could you take us to two or three spots of time in your life that you think were particularly transformative or identity shaping? Yeah, absolutely. Huh, only two, only three? There's so many we come got to plenty, mind. We've got plenty of time. <clears throat> so many come to mind. Um, you know, one experience that I'll just detail briefly, I'm actually writing about it in the current book, but I had an experience of a faith healing when I was 12 years old. I had a really high-grade fever. Um, my parents didn't know whether they should take me to the hospital or not. My granddad, Worthlin, lived just down the street in Salt Lake City where I grew up, and he came in on a really snowy, cold, wet winter's evening, and he, he laid his hands on my head, and I, I felt the power of God just bake my body clean of any illness. It was just an in-the-moment, completely immersed in the spirit kind of experience. And, and you were 12 years old. I was 12 years old, and I, I knew I was less involved. I, this is interesting because I'm sitting with one of the great scholars of Mormonism, which is an honor. Wow, thank you. And uh, I've really intuitively taken a contemplative route in life. I think I'm just maybe wired that way. It's a predisposition of mine. But I, you know, that, that single prayer, that single experience of an, an elder laying his hands on my head with the power of Christ and rebuking an illness, that was worth more than reading a thousand books and treatises and uh, scriptures. So really foundational the, experience. Oh yeah, I knew it was real. I knew something was real. I knew that there was a reality, uh, worlds beyond worlds that weren't visible by the eye of flesh, but they were, they were angels amongst us. There were powers acting on us and that it was an incredible experience to become available to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Now you went through a period in your personal life of, of distancing yourself from the institutional church. Yeah. So how do you deal with memories of those kinds of experiences from the other side of, of, of activity and engagement in the it, community? It's hard. I mean, it was a lot of, if I understand your question, there was a lot of dissonance having a, a kind of depth of uh, Christian mystical experience before I'm even a teenager. And then, you know, going through the adolescent turmoil of a power struggle with my dad and the meaning of what it means to, you know, be a Wasatch Front Mormon growing up. I mean, so there's a yeah. lot of dissonance. On one hand, church was really uncomfortable and uh, disagreeable to me in a lot of ways. And I knew that it wasn't just a lot of hocus pocus and pageantry, that something was happening there. Right. So it, it really created a, a challenge for me, especially in adolescence. And I stayed close the only way I knew how to. That actually became a formal contemplative practice. I started to just sit in stillness every day and try to make myself available to that spirit that I knew to be real. Well, it's good to hear this story because, as, I, as I'm fond of saying, we tend to forget that cognitive dissonance always lives on both sides of the faith divide. Mm. There's never a seamless paradigm that easily makes sense of the plethora of all of our experience. For Absolutely. those in and those out of the church, we continue to wrestle with things that just don't always seem to, to add up neatly. That's right. I think if we're honest with ourselves, our, our mapping of the world, our cognitive understanding of experience is always being outpaced by experience itself. So hopefully our cognitive maps, our understandings are always evolving, right. you know, to keep right. a pace with the direct experience of right. this gift of a body and a human life and spirit. Which is why you tend to focus on the concept of development as both a feature of kind of human psychology, but also of LDS theology. That yeah. Kind of congruence there. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, if I were to say a word about that, uh, I, 
again, was trying to reconcile uh, this sense of estrangement and alienation from a tradition that I knew to be powerful from a really young age. And in my mid-20s, uh, one of my meditation teachers pointed me to this book on adult development. And he said, I think this is right up your alley right now. And the moment I saw the literature, I, I felt like I was looking in a mirror. I, yeah. I could see myself in it, and I could see that I had changed over time. I could see that I continued to change, and it gave me tremendous hope for who I was becoming, and it gave me tremendous hope for my family and my community that I was also in this process of becoming. Right. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you a question. Maybe it's related, and maybe <clears throat> I'm just dwelling on semantics, but it seems that I, I've encountered this word powerful mm -hmm. in your writings before, huh. and it seems that you're not using it in just a kind of generic careless fashion when you talk oh, yeah. about the power yeah. in Mormonism. What do you mean by that? Well, I appreciate that. No, I'm, I'm deliberate about it. Um, part of it is a rhetorical shift away from uh, the word truth. Because to me, uh, when we say that something is true, it opens it up to a number of, you know, like, well, I disagree. I don't think that's true. That's, that's a hornet's nest we right. can go poking at later in the conversation. But I find that uh, the word powerful is effective and even disarming in some ways because I'm not asking anybody to interpret or in agree with my interpretation of something, which really opens up right. uh, a, a lot of room for conflict, but to just acknowledge that something moves us. Uh, I, I find that it creates a little bit more of a gracious space where we can actually right. share something of the spirit together. Right. So it's a preference. Okay, so you had that kind of anchoring experience as a 12-year-old boy. Yeah. You, you find you, you kind of had your wilderness years wandering, yeah. but maintaining some kind of a connection to what you sense as a source of the divine. Well, I, I joke with people that I was obsessed with the historical Jesus, and even Mormon history. I, I was a lightweight. Um, but, you know, in high school, I wanted to learn more about the history of the church, and, of course, that's when I found out about a lot of the, you know, uh, the history that hasn't been presented until recently. Right. Um, I, I was really voracious to just know, like, who are we as a people? Like, what is this tradition we come from? How does it do what it does? I was intrigued by it. And I was intrigued by who Jesus was. But it was more, I was, I was approaching it more as a rational skeptic. Like, I wanted to get information right. that would help settle it for me one way or another. And somehow, kind of towards the end of my teenage years, it was when I was 18 that somehow life just brought me to stillness. And literally, you know, that's when my spiritual practice became more a matter of, you know, carving out 30 minutes to an hour a day to just sit completely still. And, you know, you asked me about, you know, one of those uh, moments in yeah, life. Yeah, was there one moment in particular that, that reoriented you? Stillness was radical to me. Um, no one had taught me growing up that to just be still and to do nothing and to think nothing and to ask nothing in prayer but to just completely empty out my vessel would be a fruitful practice and uh, I ended up doing it and literally the first time I sat still not knowing what was going to happen I was just completely overcome by the fullness of the stillness. It, you know, you think about sitting still as like a whole bunch of nothing happening and everything, you know, your eyes are closed, it's dark, big deal about that. But what I couldn't believe is that I, I kind of had an intuition the first time I ever resolved to empty out and just see what poured in. I had kind of an intuition of the fullness of all of creation. And no. it completely, <clears throat> it, again, it was one of those mystical childhood moments where I yeah. knew that like what I was touching into was somehow related to the vastness of God's creation that we talk about in the traditions. Now, do you feel that when you focus on meditative practices, contemplation, mm. that you are importing something into your Mormon faith tradition, or do you feel like you're discovering something that was there latently but not fully kind of realized? The, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question, and I'm talking to the right guy right now. Um, there's a bit of a paradox in it. Like even the way we use revelation, the word revelation in Mormonism, it's got a simultaneous kind of reaching back into the past, what was lost. Right. And yet it's also got this simultaneous reaching into the future and 
putting more flesh, bone, and substance to what hasn't been fully realized. Right. So my, my experience with meditation is that there's, there's nothing that I can discover that's in meditation that isn't uh, resonating with the tradition right. already. And just um, starting to take potentials that are latent in the tradition and you know, bring them into motion. I like that. I hadn't, I hadn't considered it that way before, but I, I, it seems to me that the linking concept here maybe is, is remember. And it's one of the most frequent verbs employed in the Book of Mormon. Uh, I think of that pivotal moment in Oliver Cowdery's life when he feels himself wavering in his faith. He asks for a kind of confirmatory revelation, mm. right? And the Lord says, well, if you want that, you have to cast your mind back mm. to that night I spoke to you in your heart. Nice. I love that. And so the idea is that, that maybe this is where these two things can join. Yes. That, that thoughtfulness, contemplation, reflection are modes of memory, of the Absolutely. act of, of, of remembering Right. Yeah. That's beautiful. I'm reminded of T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets when he talks about the still point of the turning world where past and future are gathered. Right. There's something yeah. timeless about what we're touching on. But the, the simple answer is that there's nothing that I can be or become or discover through contemplation that isn't natively Mormon. Right. I mean, it's, it's really but, energized but it's, by but it's, practice. It, you're kind of going against the grain of Mormon culture, if not oh. Mormon Fundamentals, right? For sure. In, insofar as, uh, and I think I've mentioned this before uh, on, on this show, but but there is this kind of obsession with activity uh -huh. in Mormonism, right? We're not devout or committed Mormons. We're active Mormons or inactive <laughs> Mormons, right? Right. And, uh, and contemplation doesn't come naturally to us. I remember the first time that I wanted to go to the temple shortly after I had been the first time, and I wanted to go back and just sit in the celestial room, right? Yeah, and I asked right. a worker, can I, just, can I just go in and ponder and meditate? And I was like, well, no, that's, yeah. that's not how we do it. You <laughs> keep to, it moving. You have to keep moving, right, exactly. You have to be going through this, the, the process yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so literally, there isn't kind of a space carved out yeah. for, for that. Um, it's definitely countercultural, not just in Mormon culture, in American culture, in Western culture. We're in a, you could say, a process, a phase of development as a civilization where we're active, we're creating, right, we're right. doing things, and the, the rocking back into stillness and letting it come. That, I think that's less intuitive to us as moderns. Yeah. I think we're due for it. I think we're hungry it, for it, it. Do you think that part of the problem is the way in which we divide um, inner experience up into religious and spiritual. And we tend to, I mean, it seems to me a lot of the students that I, I encounter at the university tend to think, well, you're either religious or you're spiritual. Mm. And so one always becomes a, a substitute for the other. If you're mm -hmm. religious, that means you participate in kind of community worship and organized religion. Yeah. If you're spiritual, you have this, right, communing experience. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it seems to me that the mistake Latter-day Saints that we often make as a people is, is we don't realize that just because we have the template mm. for engaging in a community uh, that is service-oriented, that isn't a substitute for the kind of individualized quest for the Christ yeah. that has to constitute the heart of our spiritual life. That's really beautifully said. Yeah, I think that's an area of growth for all of us right now. Yeah, That rings really true to me. So what was it that that turned your mind and heart back toward the institution of Mormonism, towards formal kind of re-engagement with, with the people? This is something that uh, is really beautiful to me. Just to, I'll call it a conversion experience, but um, you can help me where in Matthew, might be in chapter 5, but it's, it's the verse that talks about uh, praying in secret. Um, I had the experience of God praying in secret within me, actually, because uh, what it was between like my years and years of so quote inactivity into all of a sudden I'm you know at a Mormon church for the first time in a really long time, a little bit disoriented, like wow, I can't believe I'm here. And they uh, couldn't either, probably. Right, right. right. <laughs> it was it was not a conscious process. It it just kind of happened. There was a moment of really significant stillness where I just, I felt simple. Felt like I'd returned to some kind of primordial innocence. And I, I knew when I recognized that kind of innocence and stillness that, whoa, this is, this is really something. 
But I didn't think, oh, this is really something. I should become an active Mormon again. <laughs> I just thought this is really something. And, you know, just within days, I was back at church kind of dwelling in that same kind of stillness. And I think it was significant because the church for me growing up was a very turbulent place. It was very conflict ridden. And I think personally, I needed that stillness to stabilize me, to, yeah. to actually, it, it was a balm to my wounds, yeah. to actually be yeah. able to access the stillness in a place that historically had been so painful for me. Yeah. Let me ask you another question that occurs <laughs> to me at this, at this point. In the history of Christianity, yeah. the contemplative tradition is generally associated with a kind of theocentric universe. Mm. Um, I love the theologian Kenneth Kirk. He's written a magnificent book called The Vision of God, in which he says the whole history of Christian tradition can be understood in terms of this quest for a beatific vision, mm. where contemplation takes us to this moment where we have that encounter mm. with the divine. And one of the radical innovations of Joseph Smith's theology is that he reconfigures heaven. It's not just a theocentric, but it's also an anthropocentric mm. heaven. It's mm. vertically oriented, but it's also horizontally oriented. Yeah. And so how does contemplation and stillness and meditation get transmuted in a Mormon context mm. into a more meaningful relationality to other people? Mm. Does, it, does, it, does it work in that way? Does it need to be kind of adjusted in that way so that it's just not about you and God? Uh but somehow it's a key to richer human relationships as well. Yeah, well, that is a mouthful of a question. I'm actually curious in the moment. Uh, you pointed out that you know my approach, my contemplative approach to Mormonism is probably a little countercultural. I'm curious as um, uh, somebody who's very familiar and conversant in the culture, like what your relationship to contemplation is like, what comes up for you when you think contemplation, or if you imagine a future of Mormonism that's more contemplative than it currently is. And that's not to, I want to answer your question too, yeah, but yeah, that's really yeah. present for me, actually. Uh, I think about this an awful lot. I, I've always been a little bit sad that um, in an early version of the Articles of Faith, uh -huh. Oliver Cowdery drafts, and he refers to the fact that we believe in the same holiness and purity that the early, early saints aspired to. And that drops out of our Articles of Faith, it drops out of our, of our rhetoric, our language. Mm -hmm. and, and I can see, I mean, one, one way of justifying and maybe even valorizing the Mormon emphasis on activity is that we believe in a religion that is an act of engagement right. uh, and not just a kind of isolated contemplation mm -hmm. of eternal truths. But as I said before, I think that there are a kind of cultural norms that we need to, we need to eradicate, we need to clear the ground, and some of it's yeah. just in our language. Yeah. I mean, think of how insidious it is, for example, that, that we always talk about saying your prayers. Yeah. We don't say, have you engaged your Heavenly Father in conversation? Today? Have you <laughs> said your prayers? Right? As if yeah. it's just this formal rite right. that can be accomplished as this finite yeah. little, little action. Yeah. Um, and I, it, it strikes me that, that, that prayer has to become a, a practice. Mm -hmm. and there has to be this quest behind it. And we have to carve out space right. to make that uh, a moment. I know, for example, if I can just share a private practice that I have found greatly yeah. enriches my own prayer experience is that I keep, I guess you could call it a prayer journal. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I try to have it with me when I offer my morning devotions. Mm. And it's my way of saying, speak. Lord, thy servant heareth. It's my way of saying I'm prepared yeah. in case some kind of insight, revelation, thought comes to me. Yeah. And that's, that's one practice I have to yeah. try to make uh, prayer into a more meaningful, contemplative, searching kind of encounter. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it doesn't sound so different than what I talked about in terms of for me to come to stillness day to day, it was, I knew that I was making myself available to something that was already there right. that would not be able to influence me were I not more fully available. Not different than what you're saying fundamentally. Right. Right. So I think, I think we're pointing to a kind of contemplative core or a potential uh, kind of uh, practice or, um, I don't know if we're avoiding the word practice right now based on what you just said, but just something we do 
because it's who we are. We don't do it busily because we have to do it. We do it because it's just who we are. Right. Well, I, I like what you said about preparation because that, in, in some ways, is the answer I was looking for. Hmm. And here's why. Uh, Kenneth Kirk says that that moment of divine encounter with God is considered to be the summum bonum. Mm -hmm. In other words, that's it. That's the end towards which we are striving. Mm -hmm. And you're, if I hear you right, you're saying, no. Right. Contemplation isn't sought right. for this kind of epiphany in which it culminates. Right. It's, a, it's a practice of preparation mm. for a more meaningful engagement, encounter with others. I think that's really fair. Whether you look at contemplative modes in Christianity or the more Eastern practices, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., uh, it's what I've noticed in the universal grammar of contemplation is that seeking for a particular experience is the surest way to halt all progress in right. your prayer right. meditation practice. So, and that's been my experience of 20 years in the practice that, you know, anytime I hope for something to happen, if it was going to happen, it's not going to happen anymore because I'm getting in my own way. So I think it's really uh, consistent with what you're sharing that way. You know, I'm not meditating because I hope something happens. I'm meditating in a sense to just express my own completeness in the moment. Right. I'm saying I'm actually, it, it's, it's a Psalms 23 ritual for me of saying yeah. my cup runneth over. I don't need to flit about. I don't need to seek after this or that. I'm already full. And when I sit still and do nothing but be full, it helps me embody, like soak into my tissues and my marrow that I'm complete. And I'm complete in God, and there's no other way to be complete. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Let me see can, if we can transition now more specifically into your work. Before um, we do that, okay. let's at least bookmark the question that's a really important one, this theocentric kind of this thrust contemplatively towards God versus like, how does a contemplative practice help us relate to other people? Yeah. I think that's a really important question, but we can pick it up now or- Well, come back, if, if you've got anything more to say on that right now, let's well, hear it. Well, what I'd like to say before I asked you like your experience of contemplation, um, what comes up for me immediately is that when we, when we do start to contact let's say, this spiritual source, you know, this, uh, the, the creative power, the logos that begets us all, we recognize that in every person, every thing, every activity of life. So, you know, it's the, uh, this has become a bit of a uh, kind of pop culture phrase, but like, you know, you see yogis walking out of the studio, sweaty with their Lulu on, you know, saying namaste. But that namaste, that reality that we really are the stuff of the divine, and that there's a way that we can be available to that experience and open to it and honor it. Um, it, it kind of collapses that paradox that you were talking about, theocentric, anthropocentric. They're the same thing in a sense. Right. Like when, right. I'm a, when I'm encountering you wholeheartedly, I'm perfectly present. It's not fundamentally different than encountering the divine. Well, and wish, and a, that's a practice I aspire to. It's been a beautiful practice for me. I wish I'd had you in my life 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> because as a, as, a, as a father of six with numerous projects in grad school, and right. I wasn't always the most attentive listener. Sure. And I remember one time my daughter, my beloved daughter, who at that time was a young adult, <laughs> she got so frustrated with me that I think she took my face in her hands, pointed and she said, Dad, I am not a meteorite streaking through your solar system. <laughs> I am a planet trying to orbit. <laughs> yeah, you know, see, and that is the divine feminine and, <laughs> and it's grace calling you back to incarnation. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I felt rebuked. I felt right. rebuked. And I, I'm still working on that one. Yeah, me too. Um, Okay, here's, here's how I'd like to transition. Yeah. Um, your, your kind of take on, on mindfulness, contemplation, meditation has opened a space for some individuals who weren't finding other effective ways to encounter Mormonism. Mm or to transition back into Mormonism. Is that correct? Is that, is that accurate? The, it's, it's very accurate. The only change I would make, a slight amendment, is that like before I even hope people to encounter Mormonism, I hope they encounter something powerful and something real. And I, I put my faith 
in you know other agents that can carry on the conversion work from there. But I do when I share contemplative practice meditation in the lower lights community, for example, it's with a deep trust that uh, there is a basic goodness that animates life. Yeah. There is a spirit. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're clarifying this because listeners haven't had all of our heard all of our background. Right. and prior conversations. But one thing I really love about your orientation, Tom, is that you always make it clear that the priority is Christ hmm. and that Mormonism is a particular incarnation, an institutional vehicle with that end. But we tend to forget that in our language, as I did a moment ago. And I, sure. you know, in a way, that was a, that was a, a, a gentle but due correction. <laughs> well, that, and I would take yeah. it, we'll see how this flies on this Faith Matters podcast, but I would take it even another step back. Even before I orient people towards Christ, I exercise a faith that there, there is something that I don't need to name that is powerful, that is redemptive. Right. that will purify us if we make ourselves right. available to it. Let me turn to a couple of things that you've said in your, in your writing that I think are particularly um, poignant and, and perceptive. One, one is you say in your book on navigating Mormon faith crisis, my wish is to allow different kinds of faith to flourish. Mm. But even as you say that, there's a counterweight right, to that <laughs> when you say, but I've wondered is my perspective mainstream enough? Right. Um, so talk a little bit about that, for, about the first half, about creating that space. How, how have you seen that happen? Yeah. Um, what other kinds of things, strategies, maneuvers can we engage in as a people to create that space? Right. And then talk a little bit about your worries about orthodoxy. Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. Um, what comes to mind? I heard a few questions in there. Um, really the exercise we were just engaged in, and I, I didn't see a huge reaction from you when I said, oh, let's not worry too much about Mormonism, and Ooh, let's not even worry too much about Christ. Like, it's Heraclitus, actually, yeah. was the, yeah. the thinker philosopher who said in his own cultural context that Zeus is both willing and unwilling to be called Zeus. And that's, that's quite a... It's quite a mystical statement, but if we translate it to you know, modern times in Mormonism, I think Christ is powerful enough and gracious enough that he's willing to be called Christ for those who call unto him, and he's willing to not be. And so long as people have open hearts and are available to the atonement, I, I think we could launch a renaissance you know, in our own community if we were willing to not have to name every last thing. Yeah. There's, a, there's a particular didactic approach to religious experience, which I avoid personally, because I find immediate experience to be so powerful and so convincing that it doesn't need my commentary. Any yeah. commentary yeah. I make about the power and the action of the Spirit in our lives, it's just, you know, it's dross. Yeah. So yeah, I'm but, happy to, I, I want to like really hold that cultural space and say, yeah. maybe we don't need to say as much as we think we need to say. That may be true. I, mm -hmm. I think um, I've been talking a lot in a seminar these days about the difference between political motivations and ethical motivations, mm -hmm. by which I mean, some of us are concerned about actually achieving a certain good end. Mm -hmm. And some of us are more preoccupied with, with making a statement mm -hmm. that, that defines us as agents. Yeah. And there's, there's a place for both in the disciple's life. Mm. But I do think that, yeah, uh, that, like that. that going up in, a, in, a, you know, in flames at the stake isn't always the most productive way of bringing about change yeah, yeah. in other people or illuminating yeah. um, truth. So I appreciate that. I mean, what I hear you saying is, well, we do need to say something at some point. We do. For sure. In, insofar as, yeah. as, as um, for example, my position within the, the LDS faith community is that is that there was a real person. He was Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God. And he <laughs> did, in fact, personally affect uh -huh. a universal atonement by yeah. virtue of his death and resurrection yeah. that eventually, at some point, will need to be universally recognized for mm. its healing power mm. to be fully manifest and operative. Yeah. But I also agree that in the meantime, we don't mm. need to be hammering mm. uh, that kind of confessional acquiescence on the part of others who may not be at a stage where they're ready to hear 
that particular right definitive series of claims. Yeah, yeah. So give us, <laughs> give us a couple of examples. As I said, I don't want to go through the whole dynamics of your book, but give us a couple of examples of how different Latter-day Saints relate to their faith. Yeah, awesome. This is really good. Well, one that comes to mind that I think is culturally really relevant, and there's, there's actually a lot of shifting going on in this area. Uh, one stage that researchers talk about, it's the early third person perspective. In my book, it's the expert, which is just an industry term people use. The expert is in a place of development where they have been uh, inculcated with a certain worldview. They grew up in a certain culture, a certain language, a certain place, like we all do. And their, their rational capacities are just starting to really come online and inform their more adult personality. It's a place of pretty significant insecurity in that, like, for a long time, we all lived for a long time in life, a period where we didn't have to defend our way of life. Some people don't grow up with that luxury because from the day they're born, they're born into a, I don't know, a, um, a culture or a group that's, you know, being exterminated or dislocated. But psychologically, we ideally we have this holding environment where we just learn our language and we learn our culture and we learn our stories and our values and it, we just absorb it by osmosis. But then when we get into a more kind of uh, uh, the early stages of adulthood, we start to think about things. We start to take a perspective on, huh, that's interesting that I was raised that way. I noticed my friend over here was raised in a totally different way. We start to see difference. We start to be able to take a step back from our cultural context and reflect on it a little right. bit. And with that new capacity to observe the way we were brought up comes a lot of insecurity. Like we're not necessarily ready to receive criticism about, in my instance, the Mormon way of life on the Wasatch Front, you know, for a guy who was born in 1980. So it's the reason I, I want to kind of give you a little context for this stage, because the way that plays out is that uh, I see a kind of uh, discourse in modern Mormonism where there, there's kind of a strident defending of Mormonism and anything that would seem to be attacking it or disagreeing with any of its points. And really, I think there's an expert in all of us that just doesn't want to hear the criticism. Do you, do you think, can I interrupt for just Please. one? Do you think that that's one reason why some people react so negatively to the decriminalization of doubt? Ooh, that's, that's quite and, a term you just and, dropped in this conversation. Well, <laughs> Pause. <laughs> there's, um, you know, myself and, and numerous others, and I'd like to think that a number of the brethren as well, President Uchtdorf and Elder Holland and others, have, have talked about the need to be more accommodating of those who are wrestling with uncertainties. Right. And, uh, you know, it would be a misrepresentation to say that anybody that I know thinks that doubt is an end toward which we should be striving, that it's right. a condition that we, that we valorize in and of itself, but that in the life of most disciples, there come moments of honest inquiry and mm -hmm. reservation and mm -hmm. second guessing, right. and that that can be a prompt to, to, to further growth and discipleship. Yes. But some people are, they resist right. that phase of doubt as right. intrinsically faithless, wrong, right. sinful. Right. I think you're pointing to a sea change in Mormon culture. I can't speak for the global church, but certainly in, you know, locally, I'm, I'm based in Salt Lake City. I see, uh, you know, a battle line drawn and people on one side are saying there's no room for doubt and this is the way it is. And not always, but often some of those voices strike me as just being defensive and yeah. maybe re unnecessarily reactive. And then when we get into a, a little bit later place in the way we hold our faith, a, a more, let's say a more mature place uh, from which to hold our faith, there's this kind of curiosity that comes up and we say, well, let's look into that a little bit. You have a doubt about this? Well, what does that mean? Let's, let's learn. You know, we, we develop a kind of fearlessness, like we want to just know. Right. And our intention is to deepen our faith, to develop, to, to grow in understanding. And in this case, you know, there is a developmental component to it. I want to be clear that, like, we can't use the stages to just assess something and say, like, 
oh, like this is, this is an issue where this stage is battling with this stage because we're complex beings and we can't be described just by our you know, developmental composition. But development helps inform the conversation. It helps us know like when we do run up against reactivity or when we do see someone who's so far afield that we just think like, what place does that even have in our church? It, it can be kind of a signal to us like, Maybe they're actually seeing something, experiencing something, and I can just take in good faith that they're trying to communicate their honest experience. It and just, some of those stages are endemic to the human species. They're not a sign of a particular unique crisis in that individual's life or in the religion itself. Tell me what you mean by that. <clears throat> well, if we recognize that these developmental stages are a kind of virtually universal series right. of progressive kind of stages that we go through just as human beings. Right. And that they will manifest right. as different ways of engaging our faith. Right. And so the, it's not that we have some unique problem. It's that that's just a normal part of, of growing up and yeah, maturing. And, no, and you said it, I think, just normalizing the territory. Really, my job, I work with a lot of, let's say, Latter-day Saints, former saints in crisis. I just, ever since I put the book out, you know, we've right. been overwhelmed by need and by people who like really have, are experiencing these issues. My job is simple in the sense that I'm just a lot of the time normalizing their experience and saying like, you're having this experience and this is part of growing up, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I, I think if we, if we were able to absorb that knowledge, that capacity as a church, uh, we wouldn't call it crisis anymore. Right. It wouldn't feel like crisis so right. much. I'm going to ask you to talk about one more thing, and then we'll move towards a wrap-up. Okay. But in your, in your book, you, you write about the difference between faith with a capital F uh -huh. and faith lowercase f. <laughs> right. And it seemed to me an important insight. Could you, mm. could you talk about that a little? Uh, yeah, I'm curious what you took from it. I'm sure you have something to say about it as well. Well, let's, let's, let's hear you first, then I'll comment. I think you've already pointed to it, if I understand you, and that like just you're saying that there's got to be a little play for doubt in here. Like, doesn't doubt spur us to deeper inquiry and deeper faith eventually? Well, the distinction I was making is that you know at a at, at a certain cognitive level of how we organize our experience, we believe this, we don't believe that. I have, I have faith this is true, I doubt that that's true. There's something playing out in our mind that really captivates our attention. We feel like so much of like, what's important in human life is playing out on this kind of intellectual playing field. And the distinction I wanted to make in the book is that, again, back to this theme of a divine indwelling, that there's, there's a grace working on us that's beyond any human capacity to understand or even directly perceive, and to just become available to that possibility, to, to exercise the humility of knowing that like whatever thought I have about something, whatever I affirm, is really just a shadow of the deeper reality. So there's something in there, and it, I wax a little mystical, but I, I think it's an important point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious if that was <clears throat> well, yeah, what your experience I'll, I'll tell you how is. I understand that dichotomy unfolded in our church's own history. Cool, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm working on a biography of Gene England right now. Cool. Um, fools rush in, you know. Uh, <laughs> he's, it's, it's, you know he's a, in some ways a controversial character who lived a very fraught disciple's life. But what's occurred to me in reviewing the kind of recurrent episodes of misunderstanding and conflict that he had sometimes with the institutional church. It's occurred to me that what he realized, his strength was in some ways his downfall because he was ahead of the historical curve. He is writing in the 1970s and 80s especially at a moment when the narrative of Mormonism is beginning to fragment. Mm. Uh, when alternate accounts of the origin of the priesthood ban are coming to the surface when alternate ways of thinking about plural marriage, when alternate varieties of Joseph Smith's first vision mm -hmm. are, are coming to the fore. <clears throat> and there's a younger generation of, of students who are not quite as quick to, to resonate with words like authority and tradition and prophetic voice. So he recognized that there's the difference between this capital F faith mm. 
of which the Mormon church may be the closest embodiment or, mm -hmm. or vehicle. Mm -hmm. And the many different small F faiths that are our attempts to grasp that truth. Yeah, yeah. And he's trying to work through that tension at a time when the official narrative is still very monolithic. Yeah. And there isn't yet room yeah. to try to accommodate, well, what do you do when prophetic voices contradict each other? And what right. do you do when the historical narrative changes? And, mm -hmm. and so he's kind of the first man on the front lines in some ways yeah. that, uh, that suffers the wounds of bringing to light this discrepancy, yeah. which, of course, now we're continuing to work through. Right. Um, of which the Joseph Smith Papers and the Mountain Meadows Massacre book and, and other kinds of productions are a consequence, uh -huh. a fruitful consequence, but right. a painful consequence. Right. I love what you're saying. That, I mean, that's absolutely the spirit in which I'm offering that term. It's recognizing that, you know, there's, there's capital T truth, there's capital F faith, there are realities to the divine that we can't even begin to tolerate in these mere human nervous systems and our biology, and to just recognize that we're doing our best as translators. Right. We're, we're trying to translate these awesome realities into something actionable right here on the earth. We're building a church with it. But to not conflate those two, it's like the violent metaphor in literature. When the, the metaphor is used so often that we forget that it's a metaphor, we get into trouble. And I, I was pointing to something that simple. Right. And I love what you said, you know, when you talk about Eugene England being ahead of the curve, I think in some really important ways that's true. And it points to a developmental path. It, it says that he was tuning into realities that mattered to Latter-day Saints at a time where they weren't just taken to be true. Right. And you have to ask the question, like, who's ahead of the curve right now in 2017? Like, who are, who are the people in the church who are saying, you know, genuinely, like, there's a direction we're moving in. And, you know, in order for the saints to be one heart and one mind, we must move in this direction, no matter how unpopular it is for that particular person. And I think development can give us courage. I think it can help us to see patterns, whereas before we'd have said that Eugene England is a total crackpot. Yeah. With some developmental understanding, we might say, hmm, I don't like him, but let's hear him out. <laughs> and that would, that would yeah, be a big yeah. deal if we could do that for each yeah. other, Yeah, I think. <laughs> well, I want, I want to conclude this portion, and then we're going to end with three questions. But I want to conclude with this portion by having you read what I think is a very beautiful conclusion to your, your book, um, because it seems a, a fitting coda to our conversation thus cool. far. Could yeah, you I read appreciate that, it. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. <clears throat> Historically, the question of how to establish Zion amongst the Gentile nation has been a vexing one. What will we do with all the unbelievers, the non-members? Development shows us that establishing Zion isn't simply a matter of converting others to our way of seeing, so much as more deeply converting ourselves to seeing more of the whole. All of us are engaged in the pursuit of a meaningful life. Is our own meaning-making flexible enough to include the meaning of others? Zion needs all of our perspectives in order to flourish. We can become the sons and daughters of God yet, not through a narrowing of orthodoxy, but through a multiplying of human and div divine perspectives, always more numerous than the grains of sand along the beach. Magnificent. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Terrell. Three questions for you. First of all, what do you think uh, the Mormon church or the Mormon people are not doing terribly well right now? Not doing well. Hmm. Nothing's coming to mind at the moment, but it'll come. Give it just a minute. <laughs> okay. And the second question is going to be, what do, you think, what do you think we are doing quite well as a people? So this one's easier for me to, an to answer. Well, that's good. Maybe that surprisingly, well but nothing. <laughs> I'll come back to the first one. I don't know. But the second one, I have a friend um, who's, he's also a contemplative. And uh, he's, he's a Latter-day Saint. And uh, he shared with me recently that he, he goes to church on Sundays and he situa situates himself in the back of the chapel really deliberately because he can't help but just weep when he's in the chapel. And in his words, he said, there's a field, there's a potent spirit, there's a power that's so moving and so full and so grand, it's like nothing he's ever experienced as a human being. 
And all he can do is show up for it and be available to it and allow himself to be moved by it. And he weeps. He just, he's, he's just a silent, anonymous figure in the back of a chapel, just moved by the Spirit. And I, I have to say that's been my experience, too. I think um, I've had the opportunity to go more deeply into another of one of the world's great religions, Buddhism, and really partake of the fruits, which are profound, uh, which are so much a part of the fullness of who I am. And yet the, the fullness that my friend speaks of, just the, the burning, uh, I've never felt anything like that either. And it's a total mystery to me and miracle that what came through Joseph Smith and the Restoration dilated that world navel and made those made that grace and those energies and that redemption accessible to all of us. I think Mormonism, just not by what it does, but by what it is, by the power of what it is, is a, it's a profound gift to us and to the human family. And I, I have tremendous hope and confidence in what that gift is and how it continues to grow. Thank you. I know I've felt that field. <clears throat> at some of the most harrowing moments in my life when I have found myself abroad and isolated, remote from family and friends. My experience in Ghana in particular comes to mind right. and where I needed a connection and I found myself in, a, in an African congregation, west right. coast of Africa, and, and I sat and just wept right. uh, at the recognition that I was, I was with my people um, and felt a love that transcended any particular connection. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we're going to throw out the first question, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, okay, because I had well, an answer okay, for it well, now. I was going to tell you why, though. <laughs> when my wife and I were dating, I thought, I thought that one of the best ways to forge a good relationship was to do a companion inventory, as I had been taught on my mission, where once a week you face each other and you say, okay, this is what's bothering me about you. Not all those skills are transferable to That me. one did not. My wife said, that is a terrible idea. And uh, we never got through the first one. Last question. Okay. Give us one example of holy envy that you have <laughs> experienced, something that you, that you have seen in another faith tradition, mm. and say, what a beautiful thing that would be to bring that home. The Baha'i faith comes to mind immediately. I lived in China for years, and I met uh, many people of the Baha'i faith who their, their church encourages them to just post up somewhere in the world and live. You know, it's, it's, it's a very informal and organic missionary program. They just go somewhere and live, and they, they beam God's light. And uh, something I really loved about the Baha'i faith, and we actually, this is scriptural in Mormonism, but it hasn't been fully realized to the extent that it has in the Baha'i faith, but they do not backbite. This is a commandment. Like, people I've met, I can't speak for the whole Baha'i faith, but the, every last person I met in the Baha'i Baha faith, they were just as strict about not backbiting, about not saying bad things about people who aren't present, as much as we Mormons are about not drinking coffee. And you read in the DNC, it's right there. It's a priesthood duty yeah. to make sure that we don't right. speak ill of each yeah. other in one another's absence. And yet, we don't practice that like we practice the word of wisdom and the, the spiritual practice of just saying, I'm upset with this person. I care about them enough to just address it with them. I'm not going to say bad things about them. I'm going to take care of it here. Right. Talk about a good housekeeping practice. It's amazing what they do with Outstanding. that. Outstanding. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This has been Conversations <laughs> sponsored by the Faith Matters Foundation. Our guest today has been uh, Thomas McConkie, and it's been just a delight to have you today. Thanks very much. Thanks, Terrell. Appreciate it.